ask a child the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you'll get the usual answers, a nurse, a, a fireman, although nowadays one of the most popular answers is a celebrity. The more unconventional uh, children might reply, an astronaut, a dinosaur hunter, a member of the royal family. But among one school class to whom I put the question, a lad raised his hand and said, I want to be, sir, a rubbish bin collector. I was rather wrong-footed by that particular uh, answer, and I asked him, well, why? Because I'd like to get really dirty. <laughs> That's kids for you, isn't it? Well, boys, anyway. The question behind this passage in Ephesians 4 is the same. Church... What would you like to be when you grow up? Or to use more adult language, what is the goal, the purpose of Lansdowne? And there can be no better question to ask ourselves six weeks away from the biggest change in our 138-year history. And there is no better passage in the New Testament to help us work out the answer. Before we get to the text itself, Here's a few models of what a church should not look like. Here's the first, the one-man band. The jack of all trades, who plays guitars, drums, cymbal, washboard, the horn. You name it, he's got it covered. But when the pastor of a church does everything, or has to be everywhere, somebody has not been reading their Bible. Ephesians 4 rules out that model right away. The church is not a one-man band. False model 2 is this one. Yes, that is Dave Smith. On holiday last week near Dolgethlai, North Wales. But it's not Dave's shorts or smile that concern me but the grade one listed St. Mark's Church building behind him. It belongs, you can't necessarily see this very clearly, it belongs, the church now, to the Friends of Friendless Churches charity. That's a charity working in partnership with the English Heritage Society, or as here, CADU, the Welsh equivalent. They exist to take over empty, friendless churches where nobody goes any, anymore and keep them alive to become either tourist trail spots or as something other than uh, a place of Christian worship. It's what I call the conservationist model. We preserve the church so that the present and future generations can see what it was like in the past. It's a kind of national trust view of church, turning it little by little into a museum. And given the massive decline in church attendance in recent years, it's a very popular model. In the two years between 2012 and 2014, the Anglican church alone lost 1.7 million worshippers, while mosques grew by close to a million. No wonder former Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, was quoted in the papers last week saying, the church is a generation away from extinction. Now there are many reasons for that dramatic drop-off. But one of them is this conservationist mindset. Where we're only interested in keeping things the same in preserving our traditions, in maintaining our programs, in doing what we've always done. And if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. But that static, risk-averse model is not the one on offer in Ephesians 4. A third false model of church is the supporters club. That's a picture of that great night a few weeks ago at the Gold Sands Stadium, home of AFC Bournemouth. The supporters of the Cherries swamped the pitch in their thousands to celebrate promotion to the Premiership. Now, don't get me wrong, a football club needs its supporters 
It's people who cheer from the sands, stands and the sands, <laughs> and who travel away to the games and buy their season tickets year on year. But in a church, if all we've got is supporters cheering or booing from the pews on the touchline, yet who never wear the kit or turn up for training sessions on cold, dark nights in winter, then we're not reading the game accurately in Ephesians chapter 4. So if those are three false models, what is the real purpose of the church? What should Lansdowne look like when it grows up? Three key words, unity, diversity, maturity. Here's the first, the unity we enjoy. Listen to the text, verse 3, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Notice that the command there in verse 3 is to maintain a unity we already have. Our task as church is not to create what doesn't exist, but to celebrate what already does. And it's based upon the seven elements of verses 4 to 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So our unity is an expression of the oneness of the faith we believe. We are one body, the result of the one spirit who's called us to the one hope in Jesus, who is the one Lord. That, friends, is the one faith. And we demonstrate our commitment to that one faith in the one baptism. That, friends, is the gospel, and there can be no real unity without that gospel. Now, of course, there's an awful lot that distinguishes us from each other. Take, for example, our gender differences. Those of us who were at the excellent men's breakfast yesterday morning learned from a, a reliable survey sample that the average man will use 10,000 words a day in his speech communication, whereas a woman will use 45,000 words a day. That means, guys, that the girls will speak four times more than you will in a normal average day. I guess you didn't realize that, did you? A woman will regard a meaningful conversation as consisting of 45 to 60 minutes a day, whereas a man thinks that 15 to 20 minutes is enough for an entire week. <laughs> Do you see, no wonder men and women struggle to communicate. We are so different. And then there's our, our church culture and background differences. You see, we, we may be authorized King James Version of the Bible people. We may be, as we are in Lansdowne, the New International Version. Or you may be an Any Bible Version. You may be this morning pre-mill, post-mill, or pan-millennial. By the way, if you don't know what those categories mean, it doesn't matter really. We may raise our hands in worship. We may put them up discreetly while no one is looking or we may sellotape them firmly to our sides. But there is something much greater that holds us together. Whoever we are, man or woman, Anglican, Methodist, or Assemblies of God, English, Asian, African, or Latin American, if we are in Christ, we enjoy the one spirit and the one faith and the one hope and the one baptism. And we need to celebrate that but we also need to maintain it. We can't hear those words, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, without thinking, do I? Do I make every effort? This week, has that been my motivation? Has my instinct been that of a peacemaker or a troublemaker? Have I really been wearing around my neck a notice that says, beware of the dog? 
You see, at, at one level, our unity is, is uh, unbreakable because it's grounded in the one gospel of Jesus. But at another level, it is vulnerable because it's the product of people like us, fallible people. This is called sheep shock. What is sheep shock? Sheep shock is the moment when a new Christian makes the shocking discovery that some preachers may wax eloquent on Sundays and love other men's wives on Mondays. The churches which display God is love on the outside of their notice boards are at each other's throats on the inside. That is sheep shock. And it can be very disillusioning. There is an amazing degree of unity in Lansdowne, given how different we are and how much change we're going through right now. But I want to say to you this morning, don't take that unity for granted. That's Paul's point. Work at it. How? Well, listen to verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. That's how we maintain our unity. It's a calling, an attitude. So like those parcels which arrive at your front door by special delivery, stamped with the words, fragile, handle with care. We need to handle the unity of the church with care. Our unity then is an expression of the oneness of the faith we believe. But it's also an expression of the oneness of the God we worship. There is in God this wonderful unity of love and purpose. For all eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are pouring love and joy and adoration into the other, seeking one another's glory. Jesus talks about it in the Gospels as he prays for his disciples. I pray that they may be one, Father, even as we are one. The one Lord, you see, the one Spirit, the one God and Father of all. This dynamic community of self-giving love. One in being, one in purpose and aim, one in identity forever. That is an indestructible unity in God, which is to be reflected in the unity of the church. For the one church shares the life of this one God. So the first part of our purpose as we grow is a call to unity. The second is a call to experience diversity. Here we are in verses 7 to 11. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Unity is not uniformity. It's not that way in God, who is Father, Son, and Spirit, or that way in the church of God. For diversity is the way that Jesus has made us and builds his church. So we are not to be afraid of our different backgrounds and ages and genders. We are to embrace them as Christ's gift to us. God intends our variety as a blessing for our unity, not as a threat to it. According to that verse 7, these are what? Gifts of grace given as Christ sees fit. So we ought not to boast about them on the one hand or moan about them on the other. We've all been given gifts to express our diversity and to maintain that unity. Verse 8, if you look at it in your Bible, is quoting Psalm 68 which describes the way God's king leads his people in triumph and hands out the spoils of victory. Now, Paul applies that here to Jesus. Jesus is the king of God's people, and by his death and resurrection, Jesus has been raised. And because of his ascension to heaven, Jesus has poured out these victory gifts of the Spirit upon his people. So, verse 10 he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he 
who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastor teachers. Jesus, you see, hands out presents to every Christian to help them become part of his growing body. And verse 11 is one of the many lists of gifts in the New Testament, which Jesus, through his Spirit, gives to the church. So, so the ones that you've got there in verse 11 are not the only ones. However, they are fundamental in helping the church to grow up. Do you notice what's true of every single gift mentioned in verse 11? They have one thing in common. They are all word gifts. You see that? They're word gifts. Apostle, and prophet, evangelist, and pastor, teacher. For the word of God is the primary means by which the church of God grows and the people of God are built up. So you see, we have the foundation, word gifts of apostle and prophet. Next, comes the evangelist with his extension word gift so that new people are added to the church and new churches are planted. Finally comes the continuation word gift of the pastor teacher. This is for the ongoing life of the church. It's through the role of this person that Christ feeds and protects and cares for his people. Now all of these are Christ's gifts to the church. They are not produced by the church, and in that sense, they are not employed by the church. They are given to it by the head of the church. But why? Well, the answer is our third key word. The answer is maturity. They're given for maturity. That's the third element which gives us our our, our goal or, or purpose as a church. We enjoy unity. We experience diversity in order to acquire maturity. So let's lastly look at that in verses 12 to 16, the maturity that we acquire. The text of verse 12 says, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor teachers. Why? Here's the purpose, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. The purpose of all those word gifts is to mobilize people for ministry. And ministry is the route to maturity. That's what verse 12 says. That growth is the purpose of the church. And by growth, we do not mean how many newcomers this month. How many baptisms this year? How many in small groups right now? How many new programs are we creating? It's no good just getting bigger as a church. We've got to get fitter as a church. And so the key growth question is, how do we help someone grow spiritually? How does that activity in Lansdowne enable someone to take the next steps in their Christian faith? How does that event that I'm putting on or the group I organize root people into a stronger living relationship with Christ? You see, that's what Lansdowne Church is in business for, to make us more devoted followers of the Lord Jesus. The great purpose of a church like this is not to make you a better person, a nicer neighbor, or a more helpful employee. Those are likely byproducts. No, the great purpose of a church like this is to turn people into disciples of Christ and citizens of heaven. So what we need to grasp then is the measure of this growth. And verse 13 tells us what that is. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's the measure of growth. That's our target, what we're aiming at as a church. We want to help people grow towards unity in the faith. That is, in their understanding of the content of the Christian gospel. But also, we want to help people grow towards knowledge of the Son of God, that is, in their relationship to Jesus, knowing him better. 
and loving him more. So the primary purpose of Lansdowne is not to cram as many people as possible into the building on a Sunday morning, but to create a community in which knowing and loving Jesus is what we are all together and each individually excited about. My growth, your growth, our growth. On the one hand, then, this is a picture of dynamic change and movement. It is not that conservationist model of the church, that national trust view where we simply preserve things so that people in the present and future can see the way it used to be. It also means that we never get to the point when we say, well, Lansdowne has arrived. We're there. I don't need to grow anymore in the fullness of my understanding of the faith or in my love for Christ. No, a mature church is a church that knows how much more maturing is to be done. And verse 12 says that we are a body being built. Being built. In other words, we never stop growing to maturity. Unlike, unlike the human body, all of us reach what's called that stage of maturity. I don't know what it is, 30, 40, 50, uh, uh, from which point everything appears to break down, fall apart, or, or drop off. This happened to me on Thursday morning when I forgot why I left my office study at church. I got up from the desk, made my way down the stairs, but when I got to the bottom... I didn't know what I was doing there. I knew I was on my way somewhere, but couldn't work out where. Anyway, I went back to my room, sat at the desk again, answered a few uh, phone calls, and an hour later remembered that it was the toilet I was making for. <laughs> now, that sort of thing may not be happening to all you youngsters out there, but here's the bad news. It will. Give it time. You see, you get to 55, you leave a room, and you can't remember where you're going. And it takes you an hour to work out why. But the good news is that as far as the body of Christ is concerned, it's onward and ever upward. There are no limits to its continuous growth. We're aiming at the measure of the fullness of Christ, remember. So we're not going to settle down and coast to heaven. We've got more growing up to do. The other picture we've got here is this corporate one, says Paul, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. That is the, the measure of growth. All of us together and each of us individually. Everything working together. It clicks. Christianity is fundamentally a team game. It is not a supporters club. And that's why actively belonging to church and getting involved is crucial. We need each other to grow up, to reach maturity. Each of us involved in the development of the whole. Your contribution, your presence, your conversations, your encouragement, your prayers, your giving, your serving. It's the team that counts. That's why this morning we put in the pews, this little getting involved card. And if you're not yet plugged in somewhere into the body of Christ here at Lansdowne and want to get involved, then take that card away, fill it in as you have coffee and tea, and leave it with us. We'd love to get more of you involved in the body ministry of the church, for it's the team that counts. So if the true measure of growth is unity and maturity in the faith and in love for Jesus, if our business is growing people who are growing, how does that happen? What's the means of growth? Well, we've already touched on it. Jesus, the head of the church, has given us the resources for our growth. Listen again to verse 12. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor teachers to prepare God's people for works of service. Literally, to be ministers. 
Hear me on this. The ministers of Lansdowne are not Peter, Paul, and Miles. I was going to say Peter, Paul, and Mary, but that wouldn't be right. The ministers of Lansdowne are not Peter, Paul, and Miles. The ministers of Lansdowne, biblically, are the whole congregation. You see, let me put it to you in maybe a, a slightly edgy way. You don't pay me to do all the work. No. You pay me to get you to do some of the work with me. That's the deal. Christ has given gifts to the church, the gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Why? To prepare all of God's church to be ministers for works of service. You see, the, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastor, teachers, the foundation gifts, the extension gift, the ongoing gift, that's just the start of things. The end game is the whole body being trained and equipped and resourced and encouraged. The ministry of all the people of God is needed to build the church of God. Our Bible has no clergy laity division. Yes, there are appropriately gifted people appointed by the risen Christ. But ministry doesn't stop with them. The whole team is involved in different ways. So the pastor teachers, the ministry and small group leaders here in Lansdowne, the staff members, we do our job most effectively when more people are trained, when more people are empowered, when we delegate to more people, when we don't play all the instruments ourselves, when we get the whole orchestra playing. You see, this is not a one-man band model. We create opportunities for works of service. So, so here's the challenge. Where are you serving right now among us? Because if you're not serving somewhere, you're not growing. And if you're not growing, the church is not going anywhere. Finally then, the marks of growth. How do we know we are growing up as a church, maturing as a Christian? Is it if we feel good? If I can recite Bible verses from memory? Is it how many Christian badges I wear? The first mark is stability, verse 14. Then we will no longer be infants, you see the imagery? No longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. No longer infants, but rather stable. You've got two different images there to describe a small child, an infant. They are unstable, says Paul, like a boat at sea, rolling around in a storm. And secondly, they are easily distracted by someone who's clever at card tricks. Loaded die is actually the original picture. Did you see, did you see the final last Saturday evening of Britain's Got Talented Dogs? The winner was a dog. But the runner-up was a brilliant card magician. And the judges were wowed, Simon Cowell and, and his crew, they were wowed like children by his cunning sleight of hand. It's a feature of childishness to want to be entertained and excited by the latest novelty. The mark of a Christian's growth and a church's maturity is that we don't fall for the most recent Christian book that promises to solve all our problems forever. We don't fall for the latest spiritual circus to come into town, no matter how attractive the packaging and smooth the presentation. We don't get blown around by every wind of teaching that appears on the Christian fringe culture. No, it's a mark of a maturing Christian community that we don't simply get on board with the latest trendy idea. God has something better for us. And verse 15 explains what it is. Instead of being infants, instead of being distracted by the latest this or that, instead speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him 
who is the head that is Christ, speaking the truth in love. The church cannot become mature without both, without truth and without love. For it is in the truth that the church grows and builds itself up. And love is the way to do that. A love for truth, yes, but also for handling the truth, applying the truth with compassion and love. We are not to polarize and say, ah, you know, I'm a truth Christian. I'm into doctrine. I'm into the Bible. I'm into the mind. While others say, ah, but I'm a love Christian. Into experience and feelings and relationships and emotions. Paul is saying we need both at the same time. For without both together, truth becomes hard and love becomes soft. It's no use, is it, having all the right answers if we have no compassion. People are driven away from faith in Christ as much by the lovelessness of the church as by the flakiness of the church. So speaking truth in love is when people matter as well as principles. When I can make my point without destroying the other person. For as our final verse says, the goal of maturity is for each and all together to grow up into Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Love is to be the measurement finally of how the body builds itself. To love Christ and his truth. To love others the way Jesus does. That's how we grow up as as every part of the body is vitally connected to Christ, the head. So I ask you, what is your relationship to Christ and to his body, the church, here at Lansdowne? Don't be a grumbling appendix or an irritating bowel or a clot in the circulation of the church. Be a fully functioning ligament joined to Christ and his people, praying, serving, encouraging, supporting, growing up, fit for purpose, to enjoy unity, to experience diversity, and to acquire maturity. So let's have the group up to the front now. What better way to express all of that than around the table of the king? This table which unites us in the one faith as we confess together the one Lord. For though we are many, we are one body. And so with thankfulness and faith, we rise to respond and remember our call to follow in the steps of Christ as his body here on earth. Serve, serve us, join us at the front as we stand to sing, Behold the Lamb.